Welcome to this session of Get in Shape. My name is Clarissa Hurst and I'm the content manager at the Financial Services Council. I'm delighted to welcome Kate McCallum and Julia Newbold, joint authors of The Joy of Money, The Australian Woman's Guide to Financial Independence, a book that focuses on equipping women with the tools to navigate the world of finance. Now, between them, they have a wealth of experience in the financial services sector. Julia is a financial writer and commentator with a background in economics and journalism. She's currently editor-at-large at Money Magazine. She also founded and ran the Stellar Network for BT from 2013 to 2019, supporting women in financial planning. Kate is a financial advisor and director of award-winning firm Multiforte Financial Services. She's chair of FinCIA's New South Wales Council, national chair of the Association of Financial Advisors, Inspire Women's Community, and the winner of AFA's 2014 Female Excellence in Advice Award. Impressive resumes. <laughs> now, Kate and Julia are both Aussies, but uh, there are a lot of applicable lessons from their book and their many years in the industry that the advice community here in New Zealand can learn a lot from. So Kate and Julia, welcome to Get In Shape. It's great to have you here. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're delighted to be part of the New Zealand community. Fantastic to hear it. Well, let's jump straight into it. Um, I'd love to hear about your respective journeys so far. Kate, we'll start with you. Uh, could you tell us a bit about how you got into the industry and some of the lessons you've learned uh, throughout your career as a practitioner? Uh, so I have to confess that my journey to financial advice was rather meandering and, and somewhat accidental, um, but I'm delighted that this is where I've landed sort of 15 years later. I started out um, working in major corporations and doing some consulting work, and then I was looking for an industry that I felt I could not only um, have a good career in, but also that I could make an impact and be able to do things that, for me, were sustainable over, over my lifespan of, of working. And I landed up in financial services, working with um, State Street, who's a, a global um, organisation. And then we're fortunate enough, I moved into the banks in um, Australia, working in wealth management, and did a whole range of different roles, you know, so from product management through to strategy to client relationship management, and then finally landed in the financial advice business in a strategy role. And I kept looking at it from the outside in thinking, actually, I think this is a place I'd really like to be. And I think it's a place where I could use the skills that I'd accumulated to make a real impact um, on people's lives. And so that was the prompt 15 years ago to, to start Multiforte. Um, and Julia, we'll, we'll move to you now. So how did your background in economics and journalism bring you to where you are now? And, and what have been some of your biggest lessons? So I, I originally studied economics because I wanted to get into stockbroking and I loved the money markets. But when I came out, it wasn't a great time. And also I wasn't that keen on um, working in that industry anymore. So I wanted to get into PR. Everybody said you need to have a writing background. So I went and did a cadetship and started writing for a local paper. Um, after that, I, you know, edited a number of different titles and then I went travelling. And when I came back, I kind of married the two of finance and um, journalism. And I wrote for um, Financial Planning Magazine, which was for financial planners here in Australia and Super Review from Superannuation Fund. So I got a good grounding in all of that. And then, um, I, you know, I worked in Morningstar for a while and for all the other, you know, local publications. And then I decided I wanted to get onto the other side and I wanted to be part of a product provider and maybe help in the design, was what I thought, <laughs> of products to actually help people where I'd kind of found out where people really needed the help and a lot of it was in financial education. And so I worked at BT for a while and then found it, well, that wasn't what marketing was all about really. You know, they just helped when the product was already designed. So that's when I came back into journalism and that's taken me here um, to Money Magazine, which is you know, a, a great publication here and it's very well read and there's a lot of interaction with our readers and ourselves. So we feel that we're always in the know of what they're interested in and that's, you know, a great place to be right now. The first of them is do the work, you know, so I'm a big believer in get the evidence, do the research, don't guess. So really find out what's going on and be prepared to sometimes go outside your comfort zone in doing that. 
I think there's um, an important lesson in um, in really extending yourself. And so that means being curious about things, trying things that are new, exploring areas that perhaps are uncomfortable um, and growing your skill set. So that's been an important part of my career is just continuously, um, not only formal education, but informal education and being prepared to do things that are a little outside the comfort zone. I think it's really important to nurture your network. So people are really important to me. And so that's about building a good base of um, just people who you have connections with. And some of them are product providers, many of them are advisors, other professionals in our community. And then being generous. So being generous with your time, um, helping other people along. So some of the young advisors in our community, I'm really passionate about making sure that I have time for them. I refer clients to them. Um, and just, you know, make sure that we have a thriving advice industry through that. And probably the last thing is um, be really discerning with your energy. And this is about picking what you're going to spend your time doing, saying no to things that take you further away from your goals, and then saying yes, absolutely, to the things that, that bring you closer towards them and help you, I think, be, you know, feel fulfilled and grow as an individual and as an advisor. And what are some of the lessons that you've learned um, through your career so far? So one of the biggest lessons I've learned in um, the finance world is a lot of it's dependent on jargon. And that really um, excludes a lot of people who feel that they can't keep up with the ideas and they can't keep up with their finances just because they don't understand what professionals are speaking about. And that's a terrible way to exclude people. So one of my passions is to cut the jargon and, you know, bring it, to people that in ways that they can understand because we're all better off when people are better, you know, financially able. And you're very good at it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess one of the other lessons is it's not always people who are not doing well that need help. There are often people who are doing very well but they don't quite know how well they're doing and they're still very stressed about their finances. And so, you know, meeting both those needs of those who don't really understand and those who are doing well but aren't sure of it, I think that's important as well. Yeah, absolutely. So how did your collaboration then on The Joy of Money come about? You're obviously coming from, you've got Kate, you're on the practitioner side, Julia on the, the commentator side. How did you come together for this project? Well, we often found that we were at the same events because we were drawn to the same sorts of subjects like um, helping women, especially um, with their finances, because women are both here and in New Zealand behind men in both the pay gap, which I believe is around 10% um, there at the moment. Also, um, we retire with less generally and... Um, we're just a little bit less confident than men to, to do things with our finances. So we both kind of decided that we wanted to do something about it and so we would meet for lunch and so on and discuss ways that we thought we could help people. And, and one of those lunches, I was sitting there in complete frustration because I'd run a series of seminars and I just said to Julie, you know, I feel like all of this stuff that we're trying to do that's really innovative, we're just not getting the cut through. And I think we have to go old fashioned and write a book. And Julia just went, I'm in. And, and that was it. That was the beginning of it. It was kind of like, okay. And coming back to what I said earlier about, you know, trying things that are new and being um, prepared to do things outside your comfort zone. Neither of us has written a book before, even though, you know, we're both quite comfortable writing and, and quite comfortable with financial concepts. And so it was just like, well, yeah, actually, let's, let's give this a go. Let's, let's take this project on. So you mentioned, Julia, just before that, um, that women obviously face these, these challenges and you've obviously talked about these issues quite a bit um, in your lunches um, and obviously the book touches on these topics quite a lot. Um, I, I totally agree that women here in New Zealand face very similar challenges and probably have a lot of, a lot of similar questions about money to Australian women um, and you're clearly both so passionate about supporting women and, and finding greater financial independence. Um, how much further do you think we need to go both here in New Zealand and Australia, globally even, to get women there? Um, and, and how do we go about doing that? Now, you've written a book. What, what's next? 
Yeah, so I think it's one of those perennial questions. You know, it's, it's kind of a destination question. And I think it's a journey we're always going to be on. You know, whether it's men or women, helping people achieve financial independence, I think, is just something that, you know, it's a little bit like world peace. We, we just need to keep tackling it. And the moment we take our eye off the ball, we're just going to go backwards. So, you know, it, it's about being quite creative and innovative about that. I think um, in writing the book, our intention was not to solve the financial independence problem because, you know, we think that The Joy of Money is rather a brilliant book and we've certainly had plenty of positive feedback. But even if we could get a copy of The Joy of Money into every individual's hands, they're still not going to be financially independent because they've still got to engage and they've still got to find their pathway through. So we tend to think of it more about um, the, the purpose of the book and seminars and blogs and all of these other things that we as advisors typically can do. They're just part of the on-ramp. And, you know, as Julia said before, a big part of it is let's, let's strip the jargon, let's create a really comfortable place where people can take one small step that's going to have a big impact. And the more that we can just pull them along those small steps, the closer that we can get them to actually then seeking financial advice and making some really, really positive decisions. So we see you know, all of these different tools that we've got at our disposal and, and the joy of money obviously is a, a, an important one, but it's an on-ramp and hopefully there's many, many people who will work their way through some of the ideas and the exercises and the fun creative things that we've got in the book and say, actually, this is great. I've now got a platform that I want to go and see a financial advisor because they're going to take me to the next level. And we think that it's not just the jargon, but it's the way that women engage with their money that's also quite different. So we feel that women don't talk about money as a discrete item. It's about the lifestyle that they want to achieve and it's about, you know, buying the house that they want or sending the children to private schools or, you know, living with holidays or whatever it is, but it's not just about money. So when you converse with a woman typically about money, it's a more holistic conversation. And so we think that that helps, you know, connect with women, but we think it also helps advisors learn how to connect with women. And when I was, you know, working with Stella Network, it was to try and get more women into the financial planning industry so that women seeking advice felt comfortable that someone else on the other side of the table understood what they were going through and how to communicate it with them. That's actually a really good segue into the next question that I had for you, which is what are some of the lessons that financial advisors can take from your book? Because obviously it's written for female consumers, but I think there's so much valuable information in there that, that advisors could take from it. So one of the things I think, and, and Kate will go into a bit more detail on this, but listen to the clients and understand what their values and goals are. Because if you don't get in on that bottom rung, you won't get anywhere with the client because they're not engaged. They're not interested in anything else that you can offer them. It's all about, you've got to have that connection and you've got to have that understanding of what that person's really come to see you about. And I think that that's probably one of the key pieces of feedback or response that we've had to the joy of money. And that is, wow, I opened the book and I was expecting that you were going to take me through a whole bunch of spreadsheets and numeric stuff. And instead, what you've done is you've really connected with me as a person and made me think about my life. And to put that in, in different language, you know, we deliberately designed the book to be human centred, not money or investment centred. And so, again, it's, it's a way of making sure that people are engaging because if it's about them, um, and their life and their life choices and money is just money is just the support actor, then they're far more likely to actually continue to use the book and engage. I think the other thing that for advisors, um, I would say has been a real lesson for me from the response to the joy of money has been how much people have valued the section on really identifying your core values and those of your partner if you're part of a couple and then doing your goals and priorities exercise. 
And the reminder for me is that, you know, I've, I've often done that with clients in an in-depth way when we first start working together, but I might not revisit that for a few years. You know, often it's, it's five or so years later that you go, oh, you know, or there's a life event and, and you think I should redo that. And what it's prompted me to do is actually to raise that with clients more frequently. So I've been saying to clients, I think it's time for us to actually revisit your values and let's have another goal session and let's talk about your priorities for the next 10 years. And even if they push back, Clarissa, what I've been doing is going, no, 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 I think this is valuable. Let's do it. And I did it last week with a client and it was just blow away to see how they started to design new things into their possibilities over the next 10 years just because I was raising the questions and I was pushing them a little bit on where they might like to go to. Um, and then I think probably the, the other thing that's really important is, um, is not to be afraid to take clients through some of those areas that otherwise might feel a little bit uncomfortable. You know, and Julia and I in the book have, you know, been, worked very hard to come up with ways of talking about the things that people don't talk about. So whether it's, you know, death or disability or divorce, um, which we call the three Ds, but to make those things um, more accessible for clients and more palatable. Um, and I think we as advisors have a, a, an important job to do to actually make sure that clients really are thinking about what happens if they die, um, even though they don't really want to talk about it, which is understandable. And there's an advisor here that I've spoken to who actually says she won't see a client until um, they show her that they've made a will because that explains so much about what their values really are and who they value in their life. And from there, she will then backtrack to, you know, work out their plans. Some really interesting advice there. And, and I think that touches on the saying that we like um, here at the FSC, which is it's it's not about money, it's about you. Um, and I think you've really, really talked about that a lot today, um, that it's, it's especially for women, it's not just about the money itself, it's about this more holistic approach and, you know, it's about the life that it can help create for you. So, um, yeah, some really good advice there. Thank you for sharing. What advice would you have for advisors here in New Zealand who are wanting to bring more joy into the lives of their clients? Because your book, after all, it's called The Joy of Money. Um, what advice would you have? So for clients, I think one of the biggest things that we can do is help them discover the joy in their own lives. And we can do that again through going back and talking to them about what it is that they value the most and helping them to then understand how they might align their goals with the things that, that are of greatest value. And when, when they find that joy, I think it's super rewarding because it's not, it's not about us imposing um, ideas on them or imposing strategies on them. If they've actually come up with those things themselves, our job then is to help them get the money to support them achieving those, those outcomes um, and, and dealing with some of the challenges that come along the way. And as I said before, you know, we, I've been doing a lot more of these values and goals sessions with clients. And I had one just last week. And the backstory is that the client um, is a couple and, and she's facing a particular challenge with a potential redundancy. And so I'd done some financial modelling. I provided that to them before Christmas. But what I said to them was, instead of focusing on the numbers as the basis for the decision making, let's have a goals discussion. So I went and met with them last week and he was kind of like, oh, it's not really about me, it's about her. And I said, no, no, come on, you're part of this, this family. Let's, let's talk about what your goals are too. And by the time we had finished the conversation, which took about two hours, and we talked about this pivot in their lives and when they felt in flow and what it was that were going to be the bold moves that they could make in the next 10 years, some of those things were just so exciting and they were things they hadn't thought about before. And so my role as the advisor was just to prompt them into thinking about some things that were really, really different but, but really fulfilling for them. And I had an email from him that evening just say, saying um, how blow away amazing and unexpected it was and how it's opened up these amazing new possibilities for the, the next 10 years for them. And I can honestly say, and I'm sure that people listening will know exactly how I feel when I talk about this, but it gives me goosebumps 
because I know that I've shifted that couple's life. You know, they're, they're going to have a better life over the next 10 years just because of that conversation and being prepared to focus on helping them to discover the joy. Um, so I think that's, you know, for me, that's probably the single biggest thing that I could say um, that makes a difference. And I know Julia has a, a complimentary view on this one. Well, I, I think that for one, a lot of advisors don't realise their value and they because they don't realise they're not communicating it well with clients and potential clients, I guess clients, you know, who already see the advisor know what they can offer. But it's those people outside who haven't sought advice that maybe, you know, have been squirrelling away their money but working really hard and don't know when they can take the, their foot off the accelerator because they're doing okay. To have someone help them understand what their finances actually look like and how that will play out into the future can be such an incredible relief which would be joy. And there's also so much information that advisors know that they assume other people know, but we don't. You know, um, anyone who's going through an insurance application, for example, I mean, advisors do it all the time. You kind of know all the traps and tips and, and so on, but someone who's going through it maybe once every five years or so, there's so many things that we can do wrong. So the value that you can provide in helping us is incredible. And I think better ways of communicating that with clients is important. And with those other people who could be clients, whether you talk to them through radio or through a podcast or through your own website or through articles that you have posted, anything like that is helpful. And I think while we came to our book with, um, I guess, clients that we thought would be like us, you know, women of a certain age that were going through similar things in their lives, whether they wanted to change jobs, change husbands, change, you know, location, whatever it was, we felt a lot of people were looking for ways to change and it all came down to money, which is, you know, where we really took off in the book. But what we've found is that men have been reading it, you know, their wives have passed it on, people have been passing it on to their children and they've found it valuable. So I think that maybe communicate with people that you identify most with, but don't think that the communication necessarily ends there because, mm -hmm. you know, for us, it, it's really expanded. And on, on Julia's point around communicating to clients um, who might otherwise not seek advice, um, I've got a number of clients that often relay to me that they tell their friends, my financial advisor is telling me to spend my money. And, and they just laugh because the whole view of us as advisors is that we're about putting the brakes on. And I think we, we do, we have to shake it up because sometimes we're saying, actually, no, you guys are so well provided for. You've done such a good job of saving. My job is to help you make the most of it and to protect it and help you guide it towards achieving your goals. But hey, you know what? You can actually put the accelerator on. You can go and take that overseas trip. You can buy them. Well, you can't at the moment, but um, <laughs> at some point in the future, hopefully you can. Um, but you can buy the new car. You can afford to give the kids a, a kickstart. And that, I think, is, is a very, very joyful thing as well. So taking, taking a lot of the concern away, because quite often clients have really unfounded concerns. And so if we can, again, do the work, give them the evidence that things are going to be okay and help them navigate through some of these complex decisions um, without getting stuck in a bind, um, I think there's, you know, there's an enormous amount of benefit that we as advisors and other related professionals, particularly when we work together, uh, that we can all add. And on that point too, people often feel really guilty if they haven't necessarily taken all the advice that they were given the previous year and they might feel too guilty to come back or that they've done something wrong and that their advisor is going to rouse on them and, and, and so on. And I think we tried to make people not feel guilty with the book. We said, this is where you are. Don't worry about what's happened in the past. You're starting from today. Let's see what the best is that you can achieve from now. Kate and Julia, there might be some advisors in the audience today that are very inspired by what you've done and this book that you've written. Um, would you would you recommend writing a book? Um, what what would you suggest for advisors that are feeling really really inspired to to get out there and spread the joy of money? I guess you have to do what you're comfortable with. If you're comfortable writing a book, then go ahead and do so. For us, it took a lot of time to prepare what we wanted to say. And that probably took three quarters of the time to actually sit down and figure out what we wanted to cover in the book, how we were going to cover it, divide the chapters and so on. And often people think because Kate's the advisor and I'm the writer, Kate 
didn't write the book, but actually we shared it pretty much half-half and it's probably a, a bit of a challenge to find which bits we each wrote because once we each wrote our chapters, we both went across them to make sure that they sounded the same and they came out in the same way. But, you know, a book is, is a big challenge for some people, but it might be a smaller challenge to write articles for a local paper or just to be in touch with the media who might use you as a contact on certain subjects that's your specialty or, you know, write a blog that comes from your website or use Twitter or whatever it is that you're comfortable in. If you're comfortable, you know, speaking, you know, do a podcast or do videos, whatever it is that you feel feel most comfortable doing is the way we probably advise people to go. But also to make sure that the subjects you're writing about are ones that you're really passionate about. Like, you know, you've heard Kate and I are very passionate about helping women. But, you know, if you're someone who's maybe passionate about helping people who have gone through a redundancy or a divorce or whatever else it might be, or helping single parents, that might be the way to go and to get into those areas where you know that you want to help and that you have got the ability to do so. And I think that's it's a really important point, Julie, that you've made around the different media that you can use because you also need to understand that segment or niche that you're writing for. Where do they seek information? How, how are they best going to get on board on this on-ramp that we've talked about? Because there's no point in going and preparing a podcast for a bunch of people who don't listen to podcasts. So, so it's, it's a bit of a marketing exercise. And I think to that end, um, you know, I sort of I laugh because I am a financial advisor, but often Julia and I laugh because I started out my career thinking I wanted to be a journalist and, of course, never ended up doing it. But I've always written. And so I've honed my skills over many years writing client communications. I write a, a client letter every month. I have written lots of blogs and so I've done blog writing. I've recorded podcasts, not my own, but as interviews with others. And over many, many years, I've built good connections into the media. So I've been fortunate enough to do some radio interviews, which is a different thing again, doing seminar programs. And so all of those skills are part of the building blocks for then writing the book. And so my advice to many of the advisors, particularly if you're sort of thinking, oh, gosh, how, how would I even start? Just start with something small that you think will have an impact. Mm -hmm. um, and it might just be, you know, as Julia said, an article in the local paper or ring your local radio station and, and just get an interview and talk about something that um, when we did the research for the joy of money, what we were looking for were the ahas. So something that wasn't generally written about, but when we were interviewing the women and the men, because we interviewed both for the book, um, where there were threads that came up that we thought, oh, wow, that's really, really interesting. That's something we have to cover because it hasn't really been covered well before. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just about, you know, getting started and doing what suits your audience and circling back to that whole notion of nurturing your networks. The book wouldn't have ever made it into people's hands on, it, on, on its own. You have to have a network of people who'll help you with distribution, whether it's the media or, you know, other organisations who might be interested in, in telling people about it. Thanks for those really helpful tips. Hopefully hopefully, some people in the audience are feeling very inspired right now to, to do something similar or something totally different, like you say, um, find what works for you, right? Exactly. Thank you so much uh, to both of you for sharing your wisdom with us today and your journeys. Um, it was a very informative, very, very joyful conversation. So um, thanks again for, for being with us. It's delightful to be part of this and thank you for sharing the joy. Thank you.